Well, as we often do, I want to invite you to please stand with me now for the reading of God's Word. Our reading for this morning comes from the book of John, John chapter 8. We're going to be looking at verses uh, 34 through 36. And please just look along with me on the screen as I read the words of Jesus. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The Son remains forever. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Friends, this is God's Word, which means that the words I'm going to read today, I believe, are from God Himself. And I also believe that if I interpret and if I preach this correctly and faithfully, that God is going to speak to you through me, a sinful person. And so please, I ask you as, I, as we begin this time together that you would not just pray with me, but that you could also pray for me, that I would be faithful to the text, and that God's word would ring true. Let's pray together. God, we lift this time to you. God, I pray that as we read your scripture, as we read your word, that uh, it would be clear. And God, that, that it would ring clear to us, that we could hear it with understanding. And God, I pray that whatever I say today, whatever is of me, God, I pray that my friends here would just forget. But God, I pray that whatever comes from you, that they could remember, they could hold on to, and they could apply to their lives. And so God, we thank you and praise you for this opportunity we have to study your word together. And we ask that you would be lifted high above all else. So Lord, it's in your holy name that we do pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> it's known by many as the mother church of country music. Situated in the heart of Nashville, Tennessee, every country mu uh, music musician of any significance whatsoever has played here before. If you're familiar with country music at all, if you're a country fan like myself, you probably know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the Ryman Auditorium. A former church, the Ryman was the original home of the Grand Ole Opry and is known by many as a family-friendly environment, a wholesome place, and really as sacred ground for country music. But right next to the mother church is a place almost as special in country music but certainly not as sacred. And that's Tootsie's Orchid Lounge, a well-known nightclub separated from the Ryman only by a small alleyway. And since they're literally right next to each other, and since they're both kind of hot spots in country music, the lore is that country music's biggest stars would uh, start the evening at Tootsie's, and they'd go straight from Tootsie's into the Ryman. They go straight from shooting shots to singing gospel songs. They go from getting, in some cases, outright plastered to proclaiming praise, from singing Whiskey River, Take My Mind, to Amazing Grace. And I love country music. It's probably one of my favorite genres of music, but there's a tension in country music. And that is, is that you have uh, these two sides coexisting together. You have uh, uh, musicians singing gospel songs, singing songs of praise, but also singing and living in ways that uh, really brag about ongoing sin. While well, a pastor named Russell Moore, who uh, was reflecting on this reality, makes a really, he made a really fascinating comparison between country music and cultural Christianity. Specifically in his context, the, the cultural Christianity that you see most commonly in the Bible Belt, right? That southern region of the United States that is known for um, <clears throat> Bible-believing Christianity. He says this. He says, what I would argue is that country music reflects the Bible Belt. Country music is not often Christian, but it's almost always christ haunted 
you often have people who have an understanding of sin, or at least the existence of grace, but often don't understand how that can pin together for themselves. So what you often have is people who would say they are believers based on their church attendance and their even adherence to biblical values, but the reality is that they aren't authentically saved, which can make sharing the gospel really difficult if you're in the Bible Belt. In fact, I want you to listen to a pastor who's in the heart of the Bible Belt in Texas talk about this. I think the thing that makes ministry in the Bible Belt most difficult is that, that a lot of people who are not Christians think they are Christians and have been able to find support in certain churches that, that would continue to um, want to strengthen that belief that they're Christians. So, um, j- just so I'm not misunderstood, there, there, are, there are very moral people um, who live very upright lives. Um, but they don't love the Lord and don't, don't love Jesus, don't really have a relationship with Christ, um, don't really interact with the Bible much, but, but they might be in church every weekend. So, so you've got a good moral person with no relationship with Jesus Christ who has no intention of fully submitting to the Word of God who calls themselves a, a Christian. And when I say submitting to the Word of God, I'm not even talking about kind of secondary close-handed issues. I mean, just a very clear, the Bible says this is sin, I don't care type of relationship with the Bible. Um, and so that, I think that's easily the most difficult part is that people already think they're Christians. So if you're saying that, hey, if you're not a Christian, this is the invitation to you. They can't hear that because they think they are. Or if you're not a Christian, here's some things to consider. They, they don't think you're talking to them. And, and so you've got you've to add a, add a layer, add a component of, so, so maybe you, you would call yourself a Christian and yet, so, so you've got that layer of things that I don't think exists in, in volume like it does in the Bible Belt. Very moral people living very morally upright lives, but very lost nonetheless. Now obviously we're not in the Bible Belt, but I think that Um, Though it's most common in the Bible Belt, it really is reflective of small-town America, isn't it? Right? Even small-town northeast Iowa. I wonder how many of us, how many people do we know who are not Christian but are rather Christ-haunted? How many people do you know who would say that they believe in Jesus but aren't actually saved? Like, I can almost guarantee you, if we went around New Albany and we knocked on uh, every single door, 90% would say they're a Christian. But how many are actually saved? That is a question that we have to wrestle with. And as we continue in the Gospel of John, we're going to see that this is a tension that has existed long before the Bible Belt and long before country music. Last week in our series, we got to hear from my friend Michael Fredrickson. Didn't Michael do a great job? Um... So thankful to have him with you all last week. And uh, he did a great job tackling a difficult passage about a woman caught in adultery who was shown incredible mercy by Jesus as opposed to the Pharisees, these religious leaders who were anxious to kill her. And Michael's uh, warning, his encouragement to us, was that if we pursue holiness without a radical experience of grace, we, like the Pharisees, can be prone and susceptible to hypocrisy. And it is hypocrisy that's going to kind of lead us to where we are today. So immediately following that story of the woman caught in adultery, Jesus continues uh, continues to teach in chapter 8, all of which can be summed up in his uh, super significant statement in verse 12. He says, I am the light of the world. And in essence, what Jesus means when he says that he is the light of the world is that he is the revealer of all that is true. Through Christ, the truth can be made plain to you. The truth about the world, the truth about people, and even the truth about your own life and heart. Now, as we're going to see in our passage this morning, this whole idea of truth is going to be a huge Uh, play a huge role in all of this. 
Because as we read in verse 30, Jesus is going to teach. And after Jesus teaches, we're told that as he was saying these things, many believed in him. People heard his message and they believed. And so when Jesus, as we get to our passage now, Jesus is going to address this group of people. And you could not in many ways say that Jesus is going to preach to the choir. He's going to preach in the heart of the Bible Belt. But I want you to listen carefully to how this crowd of believers responds to what he has to say. Let's get into it together. We're in John chapter 8. We're going to be starting in verse 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And let me just pause right here. So Jesus has just won over many in this crowd by speaking about the truth, and so now he's going to tell them the power of the truth. And really what Jesus says here is that there is a distinction between true believers and what you could call false believers. And that's kind of confusing, but here's the distinction. The distinction is that his true disciples are those who abide in his word. And by abide, he means to continue or to hold firmly to. If you continue in the teaching, if you continue in the ways of Jesus, You are truly a disciple. In other words, genuine Christians will persevere in the faith. And though this statement might seem obvious or simple enough, there really are a lot of questions that it brings up, right? So for instance, if true believers persevere, is it possible for a Christian to lose their faith? Is it possible for a Christian to lose their salvation? And if that's not possible... What do we say about those who once professed Christ, who once uh, gave their lives to Jesus, but are now, uh, are now have rejected the faith, and are living uh, outright in rebellion against it? And if I were to guess, this is probably a sensitive subject for most, if not all of us in the room, right? We all probably know someone who at one point was a professing Christian, but is now uh, strayed away and has turned away. The church hurt them, or, or they questioned a certain doctrine or belief, or they just didn't see the point in it all anymore, and so they walked away. It's a painful reality. And so what I want to do is I just want us to keep that in mind as we walk through this text and as we talk about what the things that Jesus says. Jesus says that those who believe will persevere in his teaching because his teaching reveals the truth, and the truth will set you free. But listen to how the crowd responds to this in verse 33. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. In typical Jesus fashion, what he says confuses people. (laughs) No one really knows what he's talking about. And, And it's not for the reason that you might think. You might think that these Jews think that Jesus is speaking of physical enslavement because they respond by saying the Jews have never been enslaved to anyone. But if you know anything about Hebrew history, the question isn't who have the Jews been enslaved to? The question is who have the Jews not been enslaved by, right? They've been enslaved by Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Greece, Syria, and are currently in this situation under Roman occupation. And as we know, as history continues, Jews are continually oppressed by national powers. And so if they mean this literally, right, they would be absurd, right? Because Jews are probably the most oppressed people group ever. But though they are often slaves, the Jews believed that they were always spiritually free. 
Because they believed that since they were children of Abraham, a.k.a. God's chosen people, that they were spiritually superior to everyone else. That they were God's chosen race. And so they kind of had this get in free card to heaven by being a Jew. Therefore, what Jesus says next would have been shocking to them. He says, I tell you the truth. Everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Whoa. Everyone? Everyone who practices sin? Well, that means everyone, right? That means absolutely everyone. So it doesn't matter what your race is or who your daddy is. If you are caught up in sin, Jesus says, you are a slave to sin. And so Jesus is telling this crowd that they are in chains. Chains that they can't even see. Chains that they don't even know they have on. They think they're free, but nothing could be further from the truth. And maybe the same could be said about you. Or maybe it could be said about someone you know. They, they think they're living in freedom when in reality they are a slave to sin. And that's the nefarious nature about sin. What sin. How sin advertises itself is that it's advertised as freedom. But in reality it is enslavement. We think things or we say things like, hey, I can buy whatever I want. If I want it, I'm going to get it because that's what makes me happy. I'm free to do that. Or I say, hey, I can sleep with whoever I want. Life's too short not to live it up. It's my body. It's my choice. I can do what feels good to me. Or I can eat and drink whatever I want to. It's what I'm craving. So I'm going to satisfy it. I'm free. Friends, you are, in fact, free to buy, to do, or to eat, whatever it is you desire. But all that makes you is a slave to your own lustful passions. And so for Jesus, then, as D.A. Carson puts it, the ultimate bondage is not enslavement to a political or economic system, but vicious slavery to moral failure, to rebellion against who God made us, against the God who made us. The despotic master is not Caesar or a king or uh, any form of government, but rather shameful self-centeredness and evil and enslaving devotion to created things at the expense of worship of the Creator. To be devoted to your own sinful desires is to be a slave. And to be a slave is to be excluded from the family. As Jesus says, only a child uh, remains in the father's house forever. And what he means by that is a true child is the rightful heir to the whole estate, as opposed to a slave who would never inherit the, uh, or never be given this privilege. And so to be caught in slavery is to miss out on the blessing. But the good news is this, if the son sets you free, Jesus says, you will be free indeed. Not only is Jesus the true son, but he also has the authority to liberate slaves from tyranny, the tyranny of sin. Because before Christ, we're we're told that you are a slave to sin. That we're trying to pay back a debt that we simply cannot pay. But when you accept Christ as your Savior, uh, what he does is he pays the debt by his death on the cross. And he sets you free from the bondage of sin and gives you a new life that is truly free, that is truly in liberty. And so true freedom is not then doing anything and everything we please, but it is to do everything that we ought to do in Christ. Because when you walk in line with God's will, you are able to find true satisfaction and true joy. That is the hope and the truth of the gospel. The truth sets you free. But these Jews who Jesus is talking to, they don't quite get this because they still think their status as descendants of Abraham is all that really matters. And so listen to how the discussion progresses. Jesus continues in verse 37. He says, I know you are the offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. 
I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. And they said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God, and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he has sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But I tell you the truth. And you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the word of God. And the reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. So after sharing the power of the truth, Jesus now gives them the cold, hard truth. Jesus is going to burst their bubble regarding their connection to Abraham. Because although there's no denying the biological heritage they have, their spiritual heritage isn't what they think it is. In fact, Jesus tells them, I don't know, like, like kind of like a trashy Mari show, like a reality TV. Uh, Jesus tells them that the, re- the test results are in. That Abraham is not the father. Abraham is not the father. They, though they claim that Abraham is their father, Jesus points out the obvious which is that they look nothing like him. If they were actually spiritual descendants of Abraham, they would act like him. They would do what he did. Abraham wouldn't try to kill someone who was telling him the truth. Abraham wouldn't be acting this way. So Abraham must not be their spiritual father. Their dad must be someone else. But the crowd claps back to this, claiming that God is their father. And they do this by claiming that they're, they, they haven't been born out of wedlock, they say. Which I imagine they would have done with a little wink-wink, right? Because remember, people talk, right? And when Jesus' mother Mary became pregnant before she was married, it would have certainly appeared scandalous. And so it's very possible if these people knew this detail of Jesus' life and are now using it as a jab against him. Hey, we're not illegitimate, unlike someone we know. They think they know where Jesus comes from. But the irony here is that Jesus points out that not only do they not know where he actually has come from, but that his father is not the father that they claim to have. Because he says, if God were your father, you would love me, for I come from God. And so again, the test results have come up negative. God is not the Father, is not their Father. If God was actually their Father, they'd be receptive to His Son. But they failed that test. Which means that their true identity is revealed. Who's their daddy? The devil is their daddy. As Jesus declares in verse 44, You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. I bet the crowd love that, <laughs> right? Uh, you can just imagine the boos and the jeers and the uproar that Jesus would say such a thing like that. But the proof is in the pudding. The devil has been a murderer from the beginning. These Jews want to murder Jesus. The devil cannot stand on the truth. His native language is lies. And these Jews did not believe Jesus when he told them the truth. Because they'd rather hear lies, sweet little lies, than the truth. Which leads Jesus to make this verdict in verse 47. He says, whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. That's the conclusion. 
And as you can guess, the crowd isn't very happy about that. That's not what they want to hear. Because though they would claim to want the truth, the fact of the matter is that they can't handle the truth. Let's finish the passage. Look at verse 48. It says, The Jews answered him, Are we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who died? And the prophets died. Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say is a, he is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. And if I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. And so the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old. And have you seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And so they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Jesus tells them the truth. They can't handle the truth. In fact, after hearing all that Jesus has to say, they think he's possessed by a demon. In other words, they're asking Jesus, Jesus, are you out of your mind? What is wrong with you? But Jesus argues that he isn't going crazy and he's definitely not demonic. Rather, he's just doing what his father has told him to do. And then he circles back to something he has said in the beginning, that if anyone, uh, anyone who persists and remains in his teaching will be his true disciples, and his true disciples will never die. And as so often happens, the people misinterpret what Jesus is saying. They think he's talking about physical death. And so understandably, they scoff at this idea, and they mock him. You're crazy, Jesus. Everybody dies. Abraham died. Isaiah the prophet died. Ezekiel the prophet died. Our ancestors died. But you claim to be above all that. Who in the world do you think you are? Again, they're looking at this physically, even though we know that Jesus is speaking about this spiritually, that through Christ, people are saved from spiritual death and hell and are raised to eternal life in heaven. But there's a major sense of irony here because what do we know? We know that Jesus is greater than Abraham. We know that he is greater than the prophets. And we know that Jesus is even greater than physical death itself. As we'll see in chapter 11, Jesus is going to raise a man from the dead. And as we know, Jesus himself will rise from the dead. So even though Jesus is speaking spiritually, what he is saying would be true, even if he meant it physically. But these Jews want to know who Jesus thinks he is. Who are you? Who do you think you are? And he tells them. He says, I am someone who receives glory from God. I am someone who knows God. I am not a liar, but I am telling you the truth. And I am someone who even Abraham acknowledges and rejoices over. But again, this doesn't make sense to the people because how could Abraham have known Jesus, right? Jesus isn't even 50 years old, they say, let alone thousands of years old to be old enough to know Abraham. Which leads Jesus to say what I think is probably the most controversial statement that he has made in his ministry this far. He says, before Abraham was, I was. Am. Now to us, that sounds like bad grammar, right? What, what, what does Jesus mean by that? But to the Jews, Jesus has just crossed the line. 
he has gone too far. Because I am is a name that God actually uses in the Old Testament to refer to himself. In the book of Exodus, when Moses encounters God in the burning bush, Moses asks him, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me, and they ask me what is his name, what shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And so by Jesus saying before Abraham was, I am, he is affirming his pre-existence and his preeminence. By saying that he is I am, Jesus is clearly and plainly saying that he is God. The Jews knew this, which is why they reacted the way they did. They picked up stones to try and kill him which was the prescribed treatment for blasphemy for someone to claim that they were God. But as we know full well, Jesus isn't being blasphemous. I think he kind of subtly shows us his divinity by, again, almost miraculously escaping escaping death. But as we draw near to our end of our time together, what I want to do is, is I want to reflect on just the reality of how fast this crowd turned against Jesus. In verse 30, they believed in him. But just 29 verses later, they literally tried to murder him. We all know that people can turn on us, but man, this has to be a record of some kind. I've said it before, but this is proof that it would be really hard to have Jesus as your pastor, right? He would grow your church to mega church size, but then he'd preach one sermon and everyone would leave. Well, everyone would try to kill him and then they'd leave, right? And then it'd be back down to a small group. And then he'd raise it up again. He'd preach, he'd teach, people would receive it, but then he'd give a message that was especially difficult and everyone would leave. And you'd be back to uh, 12 people. Imagine trying to plan a budget around that, right? Not knowing how many people are going to be giving in your church. But all this brings me back to the thoughts that I had at the beginning of our time together related to what Jesus says in verses 31 and 51. All who persist in my word, Jesus says, will never see death. So what does he mean by this? Well, there's a couple of points I want to hit on really quickly. So Jesus, and really John, through Jesus, is making it clear that there is such a thing as false belief. Usually we think of two camps of people. We think of people who believe in Jesus and people who don't. But there's, unfortunately, this reality of a non-saving sort of belief, which we don't like to hear. In fact, it's kind of disturbing to think about because it might cause you to question your own belief. It might cause you to start questioning your own eternal standing before God, whether or not you're actually saved. But John does seem to draw a distinction, especially in the case of this crowd. Whether it's by what Jesus said or the signs that he performed, these people have believed in him and they began to follow him but simply out of a motive that they were impressed by him or they were well served by him. And they haven't then submitted themselves to Jesus' lordship over their lives. They haven't uh, truly accepted Jesus as their savior. And the same is true today, just as we were talking about at the beginning. There are so many people who claim belief but don't truly believe. There are a number of reasons for this, right? Maybe they felt pressure one night at this revival meeting to come forward or to raise their hand and to receive Christ, but simply all it was is they were just caught up in the emotions of the moment, and it wasn't genuine. Or maybe someone says that they're a Christian just to get their family or friends off their back, right? Uh, to get them to stop witnessing or evangelizing to them. Just say, oh, no, no I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. They're a Christian because it's socially acceptable. Or maybe a person can think they're saved, but are not because they believe in something that's not actually Christian. Like that, if they're just good enough, if they just do enough good things that they can earn salvation, that's not Christian. 
believing in that is not true belief. And you could even say that many people, you know, it's ironic that, Je- that they call Jesus demonic when in reality what these people in the text believe is demonic. As the book of James says, you believe that God is one. You do well. Good for you. Even the demons believe and shudder. Obviously, demonic belief is not saving belief. They acknowledge God's existence and even his power, but demons, like so many people, have not submitted themselves to God's authority in their lives. Because what's, what are the markers of true belief? I want to try to clear this up. What are the markers of true belief? I want to offer to you two words. Repentance and faith. Repentance and faith. Repentance. Repentance is a genuine turning from sin. It is a genuine sorrow over the ways in which we have rebelled against God and a turning towards Christ. You know, in the book of Acts, we get this account of Peter preaching to this crowd. And in, in, the, in his sermon, Peter calls out their sin. And we're told of the crowd that, that when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. They had conviction. They had sorrow. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. You repent of your sins, but in doing so, you also have faith that Jesus is the one who is able to forgive you of your sin by dying on the cross in your place. As Romans 10, 9 so clearly puts it, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Salvation happens in that moment that we turn from sin, that we confess and repent of our sin and turn to Christ. And the evidence of that, the authenticity of our repentance and faith is the perseverance in Jesus' teaching. By this, I mean remaining in the sum of all that Jesus has taught, even when what God's word says is uncomfortable, even when it is uh, confusing, even when it goes against everything that the world and your friends and everyone else is telling you. Genuine belief is preceded by repentance, and it's followed by that repentance. It's continued repentance. Genuine belief is preceded by faith, and it is followed by a continuation of that faith. And the evidence of true belief is persisting in the faith until the end, even if it costs you everything. And this doesn't mean that you can't have doubts, because you will. And this doesn't mean that you can't question your faith ever, because that's actually a good thing to do, to think about why you believe what you believe. But it does mean that these doubts and those questions are used to strengthen your faith, not to tear it apart. Because the reality is that there are some who, when they reach a point uh, that, the, that, that they question or they allow um, their, their, their doubts to overcome them, that the whole thing crumbles, their faith crumbles, which I think the author, of, the author John is hinting at as being a sign that those kinds of people were never saved to begin with. As John writes in 1 John about those who have abandoned the faith, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are not of us. If they had authenticity, if they had authentic, authentically believed, they would have persevered. But true believers will persevere to the end. Which leads me to my final and hopefully most encouraging point. And that is, is that if you truly believe, you are truly saved. If you truly believed, you are truly saved. If you have accepted Christ as Lord, if you have truly repented and believed, you are truly forgiven of your sins. You are truly saved. And that is the salvation that you will never lose. And let me be clear, I'll say it again. You cannot lose your salvation. If your faith in Christ is authentic, you cannot fall away. Just because you sin both occasionally and even perpetually at times, it doesn't mean that you're not saved. As the psalmist puts it, the steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Though he fall, though he mess up, he shall not be cast headlong, for the Lord upholds his hand. Even though we mess up, God's going to be there to lift you up and keep walking with you. As Jesus himself promises in John chapter 10, I give them eternal life, 
and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. The call, as it's always been, is simple. Believe. Believe. Repent. Turn from sin. Accept Christ. And if you feel like you're in that category, if you have never have believed before, you maybe have never truly believed, today can be that day. It can really be that day to turn from sin, turn to Christ, and walk in new life through him. If that's you, I'd love to talk to you after the service, or if you're online, send me a message on Facebook or whatever. I'd love to connect with you. Would you please pray with me? God, we thank you for your word. Even when your word is hard, even when it's difficult, we thank you that we have assurance in you that those uh, those of us who believe in you are saved. If we truly believe, if we've truly repented from our sins and turned to you in honest faith, that we are held tightly in your grip. Lord, help us, though, to uh, continue to uh, think about these things, to think about the genuineness of our belief, to think about um, this example of this crowd who said they believed, said they believed in Jesus, when it came down to it, they could not handle his truth. So Lord, help us. Help us as we wrestle through these things. Help us as we um, process what this means for us. Give us the assurance of salvation if we don't have that. Help us to uh, put our hope and trust in you, knowing that you forgive us, that you will, um, that, that we can't lose our salvation, that Lord, if we trust in you, you will save us. Give us that assurance, but Lord, also if, if we're here and we're not certain, if we feel like we've never fully accepted before, God, lead us. Pray that if there's someone here, that you would lead them to um, make a true confession, to genuinely turn from sin and turn to Christ, knowing that though they're going to fall, though they're, they're going to mess up, that you are going to walk with them every step of the way and uphold their right hand. So God, as we end our time in worship, we pray that you would be honored and glorified above all else. So it's in Jesus' name that we do pray. Amen. Amen.